What I was doing, Chris, is I was so worried about making a mistake yeah. in real estate yeah. that I was putting all my eggs, not even in my own construction basket, I was putting in other people's baskets. Yeah. I was mitigating my own risk by putting my eggs in somebody else's basket. Now they, they control those eggs and they smashed them, smashed them. So it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. What's up, Chris Crone here. Welcome to the Chris Crone Show. And today I'm interviewing Pace Morby, bro. Chris Crone. Famous from, uh, you know, A&E's. Dude, six, is this six years? How long has this TV show been running, Triple Digit Profits? We're in our third year right now. We'll go six years. We're being courted right now by HGTV to do a spinoff show right now. So we'll see. Do you think you'll do two shows simultaneously? There's no way. There's no way. Because it's kind of crazy, right? Like, I remember when I first got to meet, I started reaching out. If it was during, like, I don't know, during, like, production day, it was kind of a little impossible. To I'm not out. allowed to have my phone on set, yeah. which was a hard thing for me to swallow because you go from being an entrepreneur and controlling your life to then having somebody, a grown human being telling you you can't have your phone. Yeah. What? I can't have my phone. And so we got past that, in, like, halfway through season is one. Is that so you don't, like, leak special footage and whatnot? Yeah, which is so ridiculous. They would have us delete things off our Instagram and go, you're showing behind the scenes. We had Grant Cardone come on the show a couple of years ago, and they were mad at him because he would come, he came on set, just started going Instagram live on set. Wow! And they're like, "What are you going to say to this billionaire?" Yeah. You know, they begged him to come on the show. He he came on the show and kind of makes the rules. He kind of makes didn't the rules. Did you say the one with the gold? The person who controls the gold makes the rules. Not has the gold. Not has the gold. You, I mean, you can buy a lot of deals and buy a lot of businesses without money of your own, don't you think? You kind of sound a little bit like you know what you're talking about. I, I think I, I know a little bit, probably half as much as you. No, no, no. I mean, if we rewind the clock yeah. and we go back to like 2008, your life looked very different, right? Like what were, Contractor. What was, you were a contractor. Yep. 2008, you went belly up? I didn't go belly up, but I lost everything and had to reinvent myself. How I didn't have to not like belly up. <laughs> well, you know, belly up's like I filed bankruptcy okay. and I couldn't pay my bills. I figured it out. But it was a full reset. It was a full reset. Yeah. And thank goodness it was because it was a reset on not just my professional life, but my personal and life. And you actually decided to shift the game then, right? Is that when you first started getting into real estate? No. What I, when I started getting into real estate was 10 years ago. I've only been in real estate 10 years. Wow. I was a contractor. I was working for Open Door, OfferPad, and Zillow. Those were my three biggest clients. I was using social media showing me my before and afters from 2008 all the way through. And I get a call from Open Door. Nobody knew who they were. Yep. Nobody. And I was their first contractor, not only in Arizona, but I was their first contractor that was in Dallas. They tried to venture into Dallas, couldn't do it, called me up because I was their go-to guy in Phoenix. And they said, will you open up our Dallas and our Vegas? And I showed them my systems and processes for starting a construction company in a new market. And then they took it from there across the country. Was that weird for you to find out that there was this thing out there called real estate investment where, where people would get like a, a house at a really deep discount. Yep. Then they'd hire you to fix it up. And they the only money you'd make was on the fix up. And then they would turn around and sell it. And some, Bro, someone I, was I making was, all this money, not you. I was convinced that I was in real estate. This is how bad my mindset was. I didn't have mentors at the time. I didn't have anybody helping me. I, the reason I didn't have anybody helping me is because I probably was keeping them away from me. Uh, the blue collar mentality. Of, if you I'm want it do, done right, you do it yourself. Uh, right. I learned that from my parents. So I had a client, her name was Bethany yeah. and she would call me and say, Hey, I have a new fix and flip. Will you come and do an, an estimate and do the job? Cool. I do one job for her on time, on budget, another job on time, on budget, third job. She calls me for, I show up to the house waiting for her. She comes up, bangs on my, my glass. Bang, 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 bang. Right on my driver's side door. She says, get out of your truck right now. I'm like, oh my gosh. She pulls me out, puts me on the tailgate. She says, you should be in real estate. I go, I, I am in real estate. What are you talking about? Wow. I, bro, I was convinced I was in real estate as a contractor. Wow. And she, this is what she says to me, forever changed my life. She said, you are not in, in real estate. I'm in real estate and you are my slave. Wow, jeez. And she says, you are a simple Google search away from being replaced. Watch me. I can Google how to find a contractor and you're replaced. You know who doesn't get replaced in a real estate transaction? The investor, the one that owns the property. And then she said, tell me the excuse of why you haven't got in. And this is what I told her. I said, I don't know where the money comes from. She says, what does, finding, what, what does having money have anything to do with real estate? It was mind-blowing to me. And she said, you don't even have to have money. You just have to know where money comes from. So she sat me on the tailgate, taught me where money came from. 15 minutes, changed my life. Wow. Then she told me how to send out mailers. This is when I started my wholesale career. 
I sent out mailers from my phone in like 30 minutes of somebody finally just stopping and helping me. She went on my first appointment with me, helped me fill out my first contract. I made $25,000 assigning my first deal to her. I made $50,000 in my first month ever doing real estate. By the way, when she assigned the deal, when you assigned it to her, she got to go on and actually have it fixed up and make money. Yep. And this, this is the best part of the whole story. You would think she would hire me to be the contractor on the flip that I she sold her. Didn't. She said, you're fired. Wow. Now you know how to find money. You know how to get a deal done. You should never be a contractor ever again. Wow. And let me ask you, did you? Of course, I did not stop being a contractor because <laughs> here, here's why, Chris. I had a major mindset problem. Yeah, yeah. I believed in other people's business more than I believed in myself. Wow. So I didn't stop being a contractor until in 2018. No way. 2018. Are you serious? Yep. I had a big construction company. 2018, I stopped. Here's why. My biggest client filed bankruptcy, $16 million. I lost everything in 2018. Are you serious? Yep. I had to sell my rentals. I had to sell everything. I did not know this about you. That yep. was your do-over. That was my do-over. Dang. So he files bankruptcy. It's a much more involved story, but basically what I was doing is I was, I was doing creative finance. I was doing sub two and seller finance deals. I had a bunch of rentals. I was doing wholesale fix and flip, but I had my construction company and I was taking my profits from my real estate business and dumping it in my construction company. Again, didn't have a mentor at the time that was telling me what to do. And this guy was basically playing a Ponzi scheme with my money. He would say, invest in my deal, in my house, do the construction. I'll pay you when I'm done selling the house. And he did this most of the time. And it got to a point where I was in and deep enough, like half a million dollars with them, that now I'm stuck. Yeah, you're like, I need that money. And I kept digging deeper and yep. I was pulling money out of my, my wholesale profits and my Shoot. fix and flip profits and dumping it into his thing. And then boom, the day my daughter was born, Corbin, I got a bankruptcy letter. I'm like, what's, what's, what? Why is somebody, oh my gosh, John files bankruptcy, $16 million. I lost everything, had to sell everything, restart over. It was the greatest thing that happened to me professionally. It was the greatest thing because the universe told me you're an idiot. You shouldn't be in this game anymore. You should believe in yourself instead of other people. Wow. I was, what I was doing, Chris, is I was so worried about making a mistake yeah. in real estate yeah. that I was putting all my eggs, not even in my own construction basket. I was putting in other people's baskets. Yeah. I was mitigating my own risk by putting my eggs in somebody else's basket. Now they, they control those eggs and they smashed them, smashed them. So it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. 2017, I went through a major re a do over. Really? What was it? Yeah. I had spent a decade trying to build this real estate business and we had done $50 million in sales. We had tried selling it traditional ways through referral systems, mm. through MLM. And in the end, we just couldn't get it to take off. We couldn't get it to produce the level of profits that we need. And I walked from it. I gave it to my business partner who believed he could take it somewhere. Wow. He and I had different philosophies. And he was, he was going to give me a buyout price. And eventually, I got frustrated. And, and I just said, you know what? I'm walking. I'm done. I don't want anything. And it was the best thing that happened to me because it was... Was it frustrating? Um, You're making it sound like it wasn't that frustrating. No, it was, it was insanely frustrating. Um, I'm sure you and your wife were having conversations about how hard it was and all that. No, actually, if you want to know, like the moment when... Since we're talking about you believing in yourself versus believing in other people, yeah. After, it was in the tenth year, my wife came to me and she said, "Hey, if you're gonna like sell me the pipe dream and tell me this is our year and it's really gonna blow up and it's really gonna go somewhere and it's gonna become this billion dollar company," she said, "Just don't save your breath. I don't believe anymore until I see it." And for my wife that I love so much oh to do that gosh. to me, that was the moment where I'm like, if she's willing. By the way, she wasn't trying to be hurtful. She was being honest because she was tired of believing in something she didn't. And when she said that. I, it gave me permission to stop and learn that I didn't know when to quit. I was trying to force an outcome that was never going to be or was never mine to make. And there, I, I, shortly after I read this book that winners know when to quit. And I was like, whoa, like I, I, I had convinced myself that quitting was evil. And it turns out that knowing when to quit is sometimes one of the most important strategic moves. In fact, we all want businesses to grow, but when businesses recede, if we don't accordion back, if we don't pull in our expenses, if we don't respond timely enough, you can get burned alive. Yeah. Right. And I, and I was not learning that. Yeah. What's tough is you see these memes of the two guys digging tunnels simultaneously and one guy finds the diamonds yep. and the other guy's like a foot away from diamonds, yep. but he walks, turns around and walks away and he quits. Yep. So you're sitting here as an entrepreneur, you see stuff like that. People say, don't quit, prevail. And in my consistent. diagram, I was not a foot away from diamonds. I was a foot away from 30 more miles of nothing. Yeah. But how did you know? I didn't. Well, it was more values and the misalignment or what, what was it? You know, my, my forehead was bleeding. 
I, I was smacking it against a brick wall every single day. And it was this thing, I, I had not yet learned some of the basics of business. So the, the three most fundamental things that you need to make a business grow is number one, you need leads. Yeah. And if you have if you have too few leads, your business is going to struggle. No number matter two, how good the systems are, leads, yeah, so everything. So you could say, hey, I found the cure for cancer, but I don't have leads. Then yeah. it doesn't matter. And then number two is how easy does it does the sale convert? Mm. I had too few leads. It was very difficult to sell the product. But then the third one is I also didn't have the ability to scale it. Fulfillment could not scale. And it taught me the most important thing. So when I had my do-over, I, I went into Keith Cunningham's four-day MBA course and I said, teach me financials. And I came out of that four days feeling like I had finished plugging the, these holes in the dike yeah. that were leaking and sieving everywhere. And the very next thing I did in business, we freaking killed it because I understood financials and I picked something where I said I need too many leads, I need it to sell itself, and I need it to scale on its own. Yeah. And when it did those three things, it, what it did is it gave me standards for business. You know what's great about this is that I, when I shut my construction company down, similar to what you did in 2017, if I could go back now knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have shut my construction business down. You would have handed it off. I would have handed it off. Yeah. I would have delegated. I would have done so many things different yeah. because now you're in the private equity space. I'm following your footsteps. We're entering in the private equity space. And I told myself back in 2018, I'll never get back into construction again. I blamed construction, Chris. I blame construction when the reality is I was just missing skills. Yeah. By the way, you would kill it in construction today. 100%. Think of the roll up that you could do yep. on combining a whole bunch of construction companies together. And now we're buying, now ironically, I'm buying construction companies. We, we just got one seller finance in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And I, my partner goes, I remember when I met you, you said you'd never get into construction. <laughs> I go, but I'm a different person. I've acquired skills. Yeah. We, we have acquired members of our team that know more than I do about finances and operations and all of these other things. Yeah. And what's crazy is you can go in and just t fix and tweak other people's businesses. You know, I've had that same feeling. I could go back into that same original business now. I know what I was doing wrong. And, and the first thing was I trusted the accountant. I couldn't read the financials. Mm. All I would do is look at them, get frustrated, and never really quite figure it out. I didn't understand the relationships between those three documents. And just understanding that changed everything for me. I love that you learned that. It's just four, it took four days. For, it was, it was, the weird thing was all I did was stare at 30 different financials and he said, keep looking at the same four relationships over and over again. Now you literally understand everything. Everything is a nuance. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, now I know how to freaking do business. And, our, and uh, you know, something else really cool happened right after that is that first business took off. And um, then I learned that I was the bottleneck getting in my own way. <laughs> and so I was at this Tony Robbins, uh, had paid a hundred grand to be in this event. And I was at his financial training and I'm sitting near the front row and I've never been to one of his events before once you paid to get in on the membership side. And uh, we were in Sun Valley. There was only three other, 300 other people in the room. So what this wasn't a, like that's a cool, with 15,000 Cool people. spot. You're in this like little valley, oh, yeah. super private. How yep. cool was this event? Well, and on day one, Tony gets up and he says, okay, we're going to start with this little exercise. I do the exercise with a partner next to me. He said, so what did you learn? And I'm dumb enough to raise my hand because I like to participate. He walks right over, like tractor beam just comes right up to me. And, he, and, I, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just walked into a Tony Robbins intervention. And for the next 45 minutes, I was yelling, screaming, crying, everything. And at one moment, I'm ranting like crazy at how much I hate my team, my employees, my people don't work as hard as me, like I can't get them to buy the vision. And when I was done ranting and finally out of breath, everyone around me started clapping. And I realized these are all entrepreneurs that face the same frustration. And I left that event with the commitment to fire myself and uh, called the director of marketing on the way home and just said, you're gonna be the CEO on Monday, I'm stepping down, and that year our company quadrupled. Wow. So these skill lessons, sometimes the skill is, I have to learn something missing, but then often the skill is, once you really understand it, then if you want it done right, let somebody else do it and get out of your own way. Yeah, it's amazing, it truly is, and it's hard when you're brand new because you have to go through these hard things, right? When If somebody's watching this brand new is hearing two guys that have already made it, right. talk about how easy it is now to scale and we would just hire people, but the hardest thing for me was actually hiring my first person. Mm. I, had a, I had a coach named John Bohm. He's now the head mindset coach for the Arizona Cardinals. And I paid him $500 an hour. And I, I would meet with him in Starbucks. And this guy, the first time I met with him, very similar experience to the Tony Robbins. I came out, paradigms changed, everything changed. I had zero employees, right, as a contractor. I was just outsourcing and subcontracting because I didn't want the responsibility of having an actual mm. employee, an actual payroll, and I was afraid of the commitment. So second meeting I have with John, I walk into Starbucks. 
he fires me before I even sit down. He stands up, he watch, walks me, watches me walk over to him, and he goes, you're fired, get out of here. And I'm like, what, what did I do? What did I do? And he goes, it's not what you did, it's what you didn't do. I can, care, I can tell by the way you're carrying your shoulders and walking in here with a lack of confidence, you did not do your homework last month. I don't want to work with you. Whoa. Yeah, that, he was that. And what, did, you, did you have a defense? No. You hadn't done your homework? I had not done my homework. Oh, wow. And did you get fired? No. I, I said, I will do it right now. Please. Like, I will do it right now. Now, all the homework was is he says, and this is funny how this all worked out because I hire this guy. He tells me in the first session, dude, you're doing a couple million dollars a year in revenue by yourself. You need to hire an admin, just an admin. I go, what are they, how are they going to make me money? He goes, oh my gosh. Yes. I go, how? I couldn't justify if I pay this lady three thousand or four thousand yep. dollars. How is she going to make me twelve? Yes, I couldn't give up three grand. Yep, you've been there, I'm sure. Oh yeah. And so, in the second time, he says, "Pull out your phone. We're hiring somebody right now." Goes on Craigslist, which is one of the worst places to hire from. I don't. It doesn't matter. I took immediate action. Hired the first girl that that called me, and this changed everything in my mind. This girl, her name's Anna Martinez. She stayed with me for nine years. But the, there's a couple of things that happened from my first hire. It's $3,000. She calls me in the interview. I go, great, you start Monday. She starts crying. I go, oh my gosh, what's, what did I do? What's wrong? She says, you have no idea what this means to me. My husband's been abusing me. This has been going on. I've been Jeez. looking for a place to, to run from. And I'm like, John told me in my first meeting, he says, you're the answer to somebody's prayer and you're afraid of hiring them. Wow. That changed my life. She comes and hi works. She has no skills other than no, knowing how to answer the phone. What was I doing at a con as a contractor at the time? I would have my phone in my back pocket as I was talking to customers, as I was doing whatever, and other customers were calling my phone. Typical small business, right? I'm literally wearing every hat. All Anna did was I go, here, I'm going to go I'm going to go out to the field. Here's the phone. Answer all the calls, take the notes, tell them I'll get back to them. Just make sure that nothing goes past two rings. Open door calls. Open door. Wow. Hey, we're a new company coming into town. Yep. Da, da 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 We saw Pace's Instagram. We wanted to bring him in. She calls me up. She goes, hey, Open Door wants to interview you tomorrow. That year, I made net million dollars because of Open Door. That one phone call. Right? And it's, it's just like a restaurant. A restaurant, let's say, Chris, you take you, your wife, your kids to a restaurant and the wait's 45 minutes. Are you waiting? No. You're going to go to the next one. Yep. Like, I'm not waiting 45 minutes. I'll go somewhere else. Yep. It's the same thing with your customers. They're not going to freaking wait for you to call them back, especially in construction. So in construction, I didn't pick up the phone. I would miss out on all these opportunities. And that one hire, Anna Martinez, got me a million, net million dollars. I think they gave me $3 million my first year in business. My second, or sorry, my first year with them. Second year, they gave me $25 million in revenue, all because I actually ha had somebody answer the phone. And I couldn't, as stupid as it sounds now, yep. I couldn't get that into my head. So it's interesting. You, I, I think you come from this mindset of work really hard. My German immigrant father, it was just literally, you got to work 80 or a hundred hours a week. It's the way, it's the only way you get anywhere in life. Right. And, and, and my dad raised me on that. Like we had five acres of land out in Redmond, Washington. That's kind of where Microsoft is today, wow. but we were out in the boonies kind of out. You in grew the up in Washington, huh? Yeah. And, uh, my dad, every weekend, he would have us, he had five acres of land and he made me and my three older brothers basically manicure everything. We did all the lawn work for it. We had to pull all the weeds. He made it beautiful for being right in the middle of the woods. And I remember hating it until I turned 15 when I finally had this moment where I'm like, I'm ready to take pride of ownership in my work. I'm proud of what I did. I'm not doing it for dad anymore. I'm doing it because I'm a part of this family. I'm doing wow. that because... I'm a part of this problem. What a mindset for a 15 year old to have. Yeah, but my dad gave that to me, and um, we can we can forego talking about the other I don't know thousand times I was out pulling weeds and cursing his name and hating it. Of course. But I finally had that moment where I got there. So I think that we get that mindset, and those shifts are important. I remember the first time I sat down and did business coaching with a young man that said, "Hey, I got a W two. I'm making sixty thousand dollars a year. I'm making sixty thousand dollars a year on the side with my job, with my with my business, and I'm trying to figure out how to grow my business, and I don't know how." Oh my gosh! I, I know, and I did this. I did this exercise with him. I, uh, Dan Martell was actually on my podcast recently, and we were talking about time hacks. And um, you know, but before I met Dan, I had this exercise with this gentleman where I said, "Okay, I want you to write down." the top 10 activities you do. So he wrote down the 10 things he does in business. I said, now I want you to rate how much money you make when you do those activities. 
And then I want you to, to, to put how, many, how much time you, you put doing those activities. And very quickly, something organized where it's like, hmm, sounds like you make all your money doing this one thing. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you waste all your time doing these other nine things. I said, it's really simple. You're not allowed to do these nine things. And he looked at me and he said, why? I said, because 90% because of your income comes from 10% of your time. And right now you're working a full-time job and a full-time business. You got to figure out how to, how to recapture your time oh, yeah. and spend it intelligently. And that's the lesson you were getting, which is you got to take your, your, your lower value minutes because we all have a finite bucket of minutes. You got to take your low value minutes and trade them for high value. Yeah, I just did that recently. I do it now every quarter. So what I do is I just go on my whiteboard and I look at my calendar for the last two or three weeks and I go, where am I spending my most time? What are the, what's the perfect life for me, right? Time with my girls in the day, time with my wife, dates yeah. with my wife, all the things. I craft that out. I put those on the calendar first. But even then, I look at stuff and I go, man, I took a call I shouldn't have taken. Mm. At a time, I shouldn't have taken it. Wow. That's one of my biggest... My, my biggest problem right now is I don't know how to say no. Oh, wow. Right? And I'm sure you've learned the skill. People will call me in an unplanned demeanor. Yeah, they, yeah. Like, hey, Pace, you got five minutes? And there's no such thing as a five minute phone there's call. No, when anytime someone asks for five minutes, I'm like, okay, here we go. So 45 minutes. Yep. You want 45 minutes because you want me to answer your question, solve your problem, but you want me to provide context and a story so it actually lands and sticks in your brain. Five minutes is not going to do it. So let's put it on the calendar. And then they feel deflated. Like, oh, I asked you, pace is not helpful in the immediate moment. So then I feel bad. Yeah. So I start saying yes to everything and I get mm -hmm. caught in this trap. I am um, four years ago, a little over four years ago, my best friend died in a paragliding accident. And I had already lost two other close friends that year. And it was just a weird year. And I think God was trying to tell me something. And that was back when I was putting in, I'll call it too many hours. And um, I remember just feeling deeply inspired that the lesson I was supposed to get was that I had to act as if this was my last year of life. And if you knew it was your last year, how would you organize yourself differently? And I totally changed my entire calendar. And What'd you made, do? I made weird rules. I made really weird rules. Like from the time I would wake up early to the time I go to bed late, my mind was always in control. I was always thinking, I was always creating. I was always trying to balance all the thoughts and ideas. And I, I created these new rules. I said, my brain's not allowed to turn on till 9 a.m. And my brain shuts off after 5 p.m. And that means that I don't think about business or any of my creations Interesting. before nine or after five. I mean, did that stick immediately or did you have to work on it? Oh no, I actually had to lock my phone up in a vault and give it to my wife because for the first six months, I uh, breaking the pattern was so hard. But now it's easy. But um, in the beginning, like I would, my, my new pattern was I'd wake up at 4 a.m. I do my my I have this morning routine I really love. My wife does it with me. We're going to the gym together. We're meditating together. We're taking time together. We're reading books together. We're taking time with our family. Just you and your and your wife. Mm -hmm. And then 9 a.m. we get we get going on the normal day that ends at five. And I basically said, I'm going to work. I'm going to do my video stuff on Monday. I'm going to work from home on Tuesday and Thursday. And then Wednesday, that's my wife's and my day. And Friday's me and my kids. Yeah. I saw, I saw you make a post about this recently and I'm like, I got to get there. So, well, here was the weird part is when my friend died, I said, Chris, you have all of this money. What do you need to give yourself permission to live your ideal life? And I realized, Oh no, there was no, there was no next achievement. There was no next level of winning. There was no amount of money that was ever going to give me what was already available. All I had to do was seize it. And when I did, here's the weird thing. I said, well, if I'm going to work less, I don't want to make less. So I said, that's okay. Just change your standards. Every year I take a look at the two things that I do that make me the most money. And I say, I will only say yes to opportunities that are twice as valuable as my highest, which means that I have to do things that are worth six figures and seven figures. And if it doesn't come along, I don't say yes. And I just enjoy having reclaimed time. And all those opportunities are out there or to make it a little bit more relatable to anyone listening. Like maybe your, maybe your highest value of time is hundred dollars an hour. If you can recapture time and say, I won't touch anything unless it's 200 an hour, you're going to double your income if you do that. And next yeah. year, 200 becomes 400 and 400 becomes a thousand and whatever. Yeah. When I was a contractor, I would, if I could equate it to a small business, um, we actually, we just bought a business, the plant guy on Instagram. If you guys go to Instagram, the plant guy does about $5 million a year in, in revenue. And I, when I asked Matthew, who is 50% owner, we're 50% owner now, where are you spending your time? Same exact thing. Where yep. does he make all his money? Yep. Posting on Instagram, generating leads, people coming to go, I want to buy that plant. I want to buy that thing. I want to buy that thing. But when he's stressed out and he's working Look on at fulfilling, all the other stuff he does, he does, he goes seven days without posting on Instagram. Yep. 
And it's very obvious for somebody on the outside. This is yeah. why you need mentors and people that will actually come in and go, yeah. you're, you're missing this. Yeah. You're, I, I told him this story. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. Everybody you're coaching is like, no, 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 Chris, you don't understand. This is this very simple story. I'm in Puerto Rico at the airport looking for the American Airlines sign. I'm looking, looking, looking. Where the freak is the American Airlines sign? And this lady comes along. She goes, are you lost? And I go, yeah, I need to find American Airlines. She goes, look up. It was literally above my head. Yeah. In a way that you couldn't see you it. You just from, weren't going to see it. You weren't, you're too close to the problem. Yeah. Sometimes you're too close to the problem. When I was in my construction company, I needed John to tell me. I, you need something else to happen in your life, somebody to die to tell you what's going on. And it's minute, small things. I'm a long ways away from where you currently are. And I actually don't think so. Like, it, it, like your company is on track this year for doing how much in revenue? Uh, combined, we'll do, with all the companies I own, nine companies, we'll do like $125 million in revenue. Bro, that is, like, at some point, there's no purpose in, like, keeping track of who did more, who did less, who's further along. Because the reality is, everything at this point in your life that you want, you don't need money to buy it. I don't. Like, if you think of what wealth really is to you, because I, cause I, I, I know that you love God. I know you love your family. I know that's what you're about. You have a 16-year-old. And then you have, what is it, a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one on the way? Right. Right? So you have, you have this really young family, and sometimes we, have, we just have a hard time giving ourselves permission. I think what it is is you grind for so long because that actually was the recipe. It was like you don't know how to pick the fruits of the bushes. Yeah. You don't know which ones are ripe yeah. and which ones are not, so you just shake the bushes as hard as you possibly can for everything to fall. When you're starting out, you're looking for any and any opportunity, right? Yeah. And you work and you work and you work. Mostly what you're really working on is personal development. Yeah. Learning skills, how to communicate, how to, how to create a new product, how to do customer service. And then at some point you, you learn all of these things, it becomes so efficient, you don't actually need to do those things anymore. Yep. Somebody else comes in that's way better than you at yep. those things. And we, I've been at that point for two years. You might be right. I'm kind of curious, if you could give yourself right now permission to change one thing in your life that would be so meaningful to you, what would it be? Um, Work. I, I told myself I would love to work one day a week. I don't know that that's physically possible. Okay, well, so let's pause then. Yeah. How many days a week are you working? Six. Okay. So out of curiosity, what would happen if you went from six to three? A lot more people. Now, this is what's funny. I've been working on this for the last year. I have the right people now. They've been trained. They've been in the yeah. culture long enough. So now it's getting to a point where... Might be real. No, it is real. A week ago, I'm sitting there looking at my calendar and I go, I don't need, I don't, nobody needs me today. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. And there's this meme about Pablo uh, Escobar yeah. sitting there by his pool all by himself. Do you guys know this meme? We got some people in the live audience today, by the way. He's sitting there. Did you see my post? Where I go, I feel like nobody needs me anymore. I, be, I guess I better go create another company <laughs> was my immediate thought. Yeah. And I go, Nope, I'm taking the day off. I'm just going to go spend the day with my daughter and my, my daughters and my wife and drive them around. My wife goes, is, there, is something wrong? Yeah. I go, yeah, there is something wrong because this is something I should have been doing two years ago. So what's strange for me is that if all I'm trying to do is recapture time mm -hmm. to not work, I actually couldn't solve it. What I had to do is I had to give myself a new purpose. So like, for example, my, my favorite day of the week, Wednesday. With your wife. It's, it's, it's wife Wednesday. And we'll take the jet to Disneyland, don't tell the kids, and literally just play as kids. Or we'll go have a spa day, or we'll literally just snuggle in bed and watch some trilogy and just literally do nothing. Um, there's so many fun things to do, but I would then look forward to, oh my gosh, how are we gonna spend the hour day together? Because we get we get a whole day. Now you get to be creative. Yeah, so. Rather it, than like, hey, we're going to dinner and a movie. But, but if all you're trying to do is, an asking an entrepreneur, so how we do something is almost more important than what we do because it, it, you look at all the success that you've reaped and you know how you got there. Right. So it's like, well, Shoot, if that's how I know to be, telling myself to stop being that way when it gave me good that, stuff is That really is backwards. literally where I'm at right now. Yeah. So that's, that's where I'm at right now where people go, you've accomplished everything that everybody in the industry wishes they had. Yes. A couple thousand rentals, 620 employees, 100 plus million dollar total portfolio businesses. Yeah. And you wake up and you go, but that's all I've conditioned myself to do. And go further. Like and go if you further. do this a little bit further, you'll be like, oh, I hit another moment of significance. I'm a billionaire. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and we can get lost in the game of 
wanting to feel significant, but when you get there and it's like, okay, so now that I have the new title, what changed? And for the most part, it's like nothing. Like nothing actually changed, nothing happened. Doesn't mean that it's bad, like go for it. Like, dude, you, you're gonna be a multi-billionaire, you can't help it. Like you're not gonna stop, yeah. you're just gonna remove yourself, you're gonna let your, your legacy keep building. So it's not so much about how do I recover time. What about the personal I, side for you, like with your wife, right? So you've got, here's a couple of issues that I think there's personal development on your side. Yeah. And then there's personal development also on your wife's side. Yeah. Completely different. Yeah. Right. And getting nannies and getting people to take care of the kids and those types of things. I'm sure that was hard for your wife to overcome that and go, wait, hold on. I'm not going to be mothering a hundred percent of the we, time. We have a story on that one. Tell me. Oh my gosh. Uh, so we, we did get a nanny. We, we had, we had a hard time getting pregnant at first. And then after four years, they started coming uncontrollably and we had four kids within five years. Wow. And so at one point, all four were in diapers. No not, way. I'm not joking. Wow. Yeah. So like uh, my, my wife was about to have a nervous breakdown. And so when we got our nanny that came in for a decade, it was really about sanity. It was about just giving her some help. But our kids are a little older now. Like my youngest is 12. My oldest is 17. So they're actually basically independent. They're totally independent. And a lot of people are like, wow, you're going to be empty nesters soon. I'm like, no, no. We started empty nesting a few years ago because once they're teenagers, like you're going to spend less time with them. Um, because they want to have friends and they want to have a life and do all those things, but you're going to have, I think, more impactful time. Right. And so this was probably four years ago. I went to my wife and I realized, hey, I got my perfect life. Did you have nannies at this time? Um, we, we, we actually had a gap for a few years where we didn't need them anymore. Okay, got it. But I had brought my kids home from the pub public school system and I had brought in um, one full-time teacher that was basically teaching them. One was really kind of on her own, doing her own thing, working with my wife, and then the other three had a teacher. And... Um, I had freed myself. My friend had passed away. I gave myself my perfect life. I was living it. And then every Wednesday would roll around. And my wife was like, well, I'm so busy. I need to run errands or I need to do this. This, and is, I was like, this is where I'm at, Chris. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this sucks. And so I said, listen, how about this? I'm going to hire staff. She's like, what is that? A team, a home team. What is that? Someone's going to do the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, the organizing, the driving, the everything. And that way you can just be mom at the most meaningful moments that you want to be there for, but not the mundane ones where you're literally soccer mom, minivan, cleaning the car, right? All of that lame stuff. Yeah. And she fought me really hard. She said, Chris, I, I can't do it. I feel like you're trying to take my soul away from me. It's like, you're trying to tell me not to be mom. I said, no, I'm trying to tell you to be the mom you want to be. And after a month of arguing, I finally said, okay, here, here's where we're at. I want you to trust me for just three weeks. I'm going to hire these people. And in three weeks, I will fire them. It's just an experiment. She reluctantly said yes. Wow, this is what I need to do. She right reluctantly here. said yes. So I, here's where I'm at, Chris, because I want you to tell me how this all worked out. I've had people do laundry for a long time. I hired them out. Yeah. I've had people come in and do the cleaning. They now come and clean the cars. They do all the other mundane stuff. Shopping still is done by my wife to a certain degree, but she's doing online stuff, so it, it doesn't take that much time. Cooking, my wife still does that, right? And we've got really small babies, so there's yeah. this point where she's breastfeeding and she's doing all these things. So I might be in a phase where a lot of this is not applicable, but I don't want to marry that idea. Yeah. So we also have a nanny. She's part time. I'll tell my wife yesterday, we have our weekly um, family meeting. I go, Hey, is the nanny coming? She goes, Oh no, no, no. I didn't call her this time. I'm like, all right, you've got control on when this nanny's coming. I need to take this control because now we're going to have a family meeting with a one year old yeah. who's running around pooping her diapers yeah. while we're talking about family or yeah. ordeals. I need to actually hire this team on my own. Well, not only that, but your nanny needs to be full-time, not part-time. Because if it's part-time, your wife is trying to pick and choose when she thinks right. the time will be most valuable. But guess whose input she's not getting? Yours. Right. So you not being able to weigh in on like, hey, part of me having this nanny is some sanity for us to like to bond and build or create or do the things that we want to do too, right? Right. Um, you are in a different phase. When, I, when my wife gave me the allowance for the system, I, I, I brought in a, a, an incredible human being that was our home organizer. She, she basically would line up handymen, cleaners, all the different things she would line up. And then I, the second person I hired was a cook that was also the kids driving because we live in the mountains. And so when my kids go to Taekwondo, it's a 30 minute drive there and back. And my wife was just getting tired of it. By the way, I was getting tired of it. And my kids were also old enough where they're like, they're popping music in. It's not, we weren't always having like, like the most high quality interactions on drive time. We kind of have our high quality interactions different ways. And um, so I just brought these two people in. And then for my son, who my second, my second oldest, he's autistic. And he was creating a lot of havoc with my full-time teacher. And I said, he needs his own full-time person. 
So I basically brought in three full-time people and added them to my full-time teacher. And between all four of them, my, within three weeks, my wife was in tears. She says, this is the greatest thing ever. I finally have me time and I finally have time to be with my kids one-on-one. -on -one. Was I, she okay with having the me time? Because I think a lot of women, right? They feel like, again, you're taking the motherhood apart, apart away from, did she struggle during those three weeks to overcome that? During mindset? the three weeks, she absolutely struggled for the first two weeks. But I think that's actually not just true of motherhood. I think that's true of anyone that is stuck in a path, right? Like you've created this neural pathway to be this way every single time. I talk to someone, they're like, you get up at 4 a.m. You're so crazy. I get up at 8 a.m. And I say, cool. The only reason why I look crazy to you is because you haven't done it before and you don't have the pattern of it. You meet someone that's done a marathon you've never won before. You're crazy. No, you're not crazy. You just, you, you, you've never f f like fantasized that that could be you doing that thing. Like this is just, this doesn't come down to mother. This comes down to habits. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. People say I wake up at three, three 30 and I've never used an alarm and people are like, you're freaking crazy. I go, no, my parents just gave me this habit. I had to be up at four o'clock to read bi the Bible and the scriptures when I was young, before we all went off to school and did the thing. It was a habit. When I got older and people said, oh, I sleep till eight. I'm like, What's, are you sick? Do you have cancer? Are you okay? Yeah. It's just a different habit. That's all it was. So it's the same thing. I watch my wife. She's, she's gotten better. The laundry thing was a big thing. I'm sure your wife probably struggled with this too, is that I look at when I said, hey, we need to get somebody doing the laundry. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Like you, the only time we're bonding is while we're folding laundry together. Yeah. Are so you kidding it's, me? It's hot sometimes, right? Like super sexy. It's so sexy. Yeah. And so we hired somebody, life changer, then hired another person, life changer, hired another person. But the one thing, and I don't know that the phase I'm in is the perfect phase because you've got a brand new baby coming yep. and you've got a one-year-old and a, and a, f a five-year-old. It's seriously the hardest stage of parenting when they're all that young. I mean, that's just the truth of it. Yeah, yeah. And you're about to be outnumbered. Yeah. She's about to be severely outnumbered. Full-time nanny will make a huge difference. Yeah. Because the five-year-old wants to play and do something different than the two-year-old. And, and, and honestly, I think where, where, I, where I was able to get my wife was just this conversation of, hey, are you a better mom when you're trying to juggle all three or four, or are you a better mom when you're one-on-one? One-on-one all And day. when she got one-on-one, -on -one, that's when she got converted. Yeah, because I get to do all the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Every morning, I'll take a different kid on a date, right, before the day starts. That's part of my morning routine. Take him on a little date, drive, let's read a book, let's go in the backyard, let's take the dog on a walk, let's do whatever do a one hour date with every kid individually. And Laura doesn't get to have, have that opportunity. I get to have that every morning. Yeah. So now she's going to have that extra baby yeah. and breastfeeding for another two years. Yeah. Then the nanny is needs to be full time. Not, Hey, are you available on Thursday? Yeah. And asking the nanny. And honestly, you rebalance every year because everything changes. Things change with kids. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. You, you struggle for so long to figure out how do I make consistent money? How do I get to this point where I can become wealthy, where I don't have to worry about money? And then it becomes completely different issues, completely different things of how do I get that time back? Yeah. And is it okay? And not feeling guilty that you're doing the thing. Yeah. You so, know? so I'm kind of curious for fun. If yeah. you were working just three days a week, cause I know you said one, yeah. but I'm just going to say it going from six to one. That's really, that's really, that's, that's going to be a cluster bomb on you, bro. Like yeah. it, that's an adjustment. But honestly, if you can go from six to five or six to four or six to three, and then just try it on and get used to it, then it becomes the game of, well, what would you do with your time? What would be, and for me, here's what was hard. I, like there are some activities I do in business where it's like, when I do this thing, it's worth 20,000 an hour. And when I do this thing, it's worth a hundred thousand an hour. And when I do this thing, it's worth more than that. And so it was weird. I'm like, okay, so I just want to be really clear right now. I am choosing to hang out with my child and have a private meditation session. Cause I have a daughter that loves meditation. I'm going to do that for with her for an hour, as opposed to using that hour to make a hundred grand, a hundred grand. Yeah. And, and so what got really weird was I had learned to value my time according to money and I had to relearn to value my time according to feelings, emotions, and memories. Yeah, this is literally something 30 days ago I started saying. Like, this feeling I got, is it worth a million dollars? And I couldn't buy this back. I couldn't buy, not buy this moment back that I got with Corbin for an hour yes. spending this time with her. I wouldn't trade it for the world. So the way, that's such a weird comment, Chris. It is. It's totally weird. That these us stupid entrepreneurs yes. were wired just to go and attack money, money, money is the yes. only object that actually, it's our only trophy. Yeah. Right. The only trophy that is the measurement for success is, is there money in the company's bank account? Are people getting paid and raises and bonuses and all of those types of things? If it's not, I'm not doing a great job as the leader of this company. So that's been my big measurement tool. 30 days ago, I had this moment. I go, that's worth a million dollars to me. I couldn't buy that. Yeah. Could never buy that ever again. Yeah. You have to, you have to switch that 
neural pathway and, and convince yourself what is the actual true reward. Well, and I, I think for me, for what, what helps me cope and deal with it is really starting to realize that for me, memories are everything. Like there's no U-Haul that goes to heaven. At some point, more money is just more money. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. And so it's like that measuring stick was useful at a time. Now it's really useful in terms of measuring how many other people I can help through my foundation or in legacy work or anything like that. So it matters. It's important. We're still doing a great work, but learning how to value emotions and memories. Yeah. And then just, and then I'm just, I'm a memory whore. Like I'll go out of my way to create a memory. I want to do something novel, unique, different, never done before. Because when you're doing something you've never done before and you don't have a neural pathway for it, everything seems to slow down. It gets very enriched and you're having like a first and I crave firsts. Yeah. I travel a ton for firsts. I, 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 it's not enough. I, when I, when I, when I, when I work less, when I work part time, like my, like 30 hours a week is my magic. If I work 20 hours, I feel like I'm, 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 I feel like I'm taking advantage of the world. I'm, I'm screwing them. They should be getting more from me. If I work more than 30, I feel like I'm hurting me or my family. And so like I found my magic zone, right? So I, so I honor my magic zone. You found this part. what four years ago mm -hmm. when you hired the team. Well, I hired my team even before that. Just when my buddy died was when I just said. What was, what was unique about my friend dying, his name was Grant Thompson. He was one of the top 100 YouTubers in the world. He had a channel called The King of Random. He did all these home-based science experiments. He brought families together wow. and would have them do these really cool things. Um, you know, over a billion views on all of his stuff. Like a really big deal. And what was weird is he had this funny feeling. He was a 100-hour week entrepreneur. And nine months before he died, he got the feeling to hire a CEO hand everything off. He moved to St. George and he just spent nine months with his family and didn't work a day. No way. And then died. And I was thinking somehow he had the nine month foresight. And I said, Chris, you're financially better off than your buddy. Why are you waiting? Yeah. And what if, and you don't know when the proverbial bus is coming along. You don't know when you're going to get hit. Like, what are you doing? And that became my motivation. What's interesting is that you, you and I are both trained the same way from our parents, right? Yeah. If I wanted to go on a date with a girl, paint the fascia, I'll give you 20 bucks. Yep. Do this, I'll give you 20 bucks. Yep. Do this, I'll do whatever. And it was always a reward for money. Everything was a I couldn't. My parents never gave me anything. Meanwhile, I'm in high school and my buddies had cell phones and cars and do all this stuff. And totally entitled to. <laughs> totally entitled to. Still yep. to this day, they now have problems making money, yep. right? Which is, and now I look at that and I go, I, I, I have a sense of pride that I work hard. And I work long. The last several years, I've been able to shed that down, getting amazing people. Bless the people that are on my team. Same thing with you. I've met like a bunch of your people today. I'm sure that you have the same thing that I have, that these people steal from you. They go, Chris should not be doing this. And they'll come to you and they'll take it off your plate. Yeah. Really great people will do that. Yeah. And in the last three, four years, that's what's happened to me. I have about 80, 90 people that are kind of on the executive side, not full like C-suite, but you know, running departments. And they'll come straight to me and go, you shouldn't be doing that. You're not going to do that anymore. You're not invited to this meeting anymore because they have to fight me because yeah. I have this bug in me that just wants to show up all the time. It's the thing I have to break down. Yeah. I think the last four years I've been learning about being better at playing than work. And yet I expect my net worth to double every year. Yeah. And, and the only way to work less and make more is to shift standards. That's it. And for me, it's interesting. Tony Robbins actually did teach me this paradigm. He said, um, when you don't have anything going on, you have to learn to say yes to everything. Yes. Then when you say yes to everything, you're going to create chaos. And the only way to resolve the chaos is to learn for the first time in your life how to responsibly say no. And then as you become really, really wealthy, this is my addition to what he shared. What I've experienced is that to become super wealthy you have to learn to get, say no to almost everything. Almost everything. So it's weird that we start with no. By the time you were 15 years old, you were told no 60,000 times from an adult. Don't touch that. Don't hump that. Don't cross the street. Don't this. Don't that. What were you humping, Chris? Um, <laughs> everything. <laughs> everything. They said stop. <laughs> so, it, but you know, the parents say that. They say stop. They say no, no, no. Don't. You can't. Shouldn't. No. Don't. Mustn't. Mm -mm. And kids get that trained and when they become adults all of a sudden it's like it's your life go you're like e yes like they don't know how to say yes and so it is a it's a it's a skill to learn to say yes and then it's a skill to learn how to finally 
first full circle come back that's and learn so thing. interesting yeah that's so interesting you, so you're you and i are in the we're in the zone i'm i'm go. a i'm a couple of years behind you on this and hiring better people and putting people in the, in, in the right place to get those things off my plate you're right i mean if i just sat on my real estate that's all if all i did was sit on my real estate and let it double right i'm i'm a billionaire yeah I wait for the debts to pay off. Done. I wait for, wait for the value to double in 15 years. Done. I'm a billionaire. Yeah. I'm on path to be a billionaire. Yeah. So becoming a billionaire is no, no longer the goal. I do feel a responsibility to the people on my team. Sure. And I think a lot of that is you see the recipe of I got here. Like you said, I got here because of everything I did. And now I'm at this point and these people are here because of it. 620 paychecks get paid every two weeks because of what I did to get here. And now, wait, hold on. Now you're telling me, Chris, I got to start saying no? Yep. Oh, my word. Yeah. But by the way, saying no will do more for your people. Right. Because if you say no, if you're, let, let, let's just say that uh, as a unit, you're, you're, you're making $10,000 an hour. And then the next thing you say yes to is $10,000 an hour. And the next thing you say yes to is $10,000 an hour. What you're doing is you're just giving your people more of the same. And then you'll go from 600 employees to 1,000 employees. And by the way, you will be more financially successful. But for you to not just be a blessing to them, but for you to elevate your life, you have to learn to say yes to things twice as valuable right. and no to everything you were before. And, every, and you've got to have a, a protege or more that you're training this year so that next year they're doing everything you're doing this year. Right. And what that allows you to do is actually pick smarter opportunities for your company, which I know you're already doing. But, yeah. you're, but you have a system for picking smarter and smarter, more intelligent plays so that you're not just growing your company, you're helping more people, but you also are creating greater margin, greater safety, uh, which means that you don't just give them a paycheck every two weeks, but you're like, and guys, I can afford to do this for a really long time. What about, what are the things that Chris Crone cannot let go of 24 months from now, he still can't let go of? What are the activities? So the things that I won't let go of, um, they say in business that you either own a business, you manage a business, or you're the artist of business. Mm. And in my business, like right now, what I'm doing is artistry. So right. I'm talent and I'm basically, I'm the artist creating content. So social media, that's my artistry. And two years from now, I'm not letting go of that. I'm going to keep doing that. Um, management, I fired myself from managing all things, all people, except for any reference in the home. Because I actually hate management. I love people. I hate detest managing I'm people. I'm absolutely the same. We have yeah. two buildings and I don't go to either one of them because what I do is I go and I go, oh, who wants a bonus? Who wants a this? Let's yep. go to lunch. Let's hang out. And then my partner's coming and go, dude, you're making people not do their job. Yes. So I only go into the office once a week. It's Monday. It's today. And I stop by for an hour and a half to say hi to certain groups. And then I'm here shooting content and I go home and I never set foot in the building for the rest of the week. Yeah, that's for, me. For the same reason, because I don't, I'm not good at management. And then as an artist, I have artistry things and that's what I limit. So I would say that my 30-ish hours a week, I'd say that probably 30% of that is artistry and the other two thirds is just business development. I love business development. That's the private equity space. Um, as an influencer, you know this yourself. For me, I, I receive 2,000 inquiries a year of people saying, I want you to look at my business. I want you to evaluate it. I want your money. I want your talent. I want to give you equity. Will you do something with me? 90% of them are garbage, but there's a small percentage that are meaningful and I'll find, I'll find 10 companies a year that I want to partner with and do something big with and put in my ecosystem. And, um, and then I'll do some consulting for a number of other companies that I'll So you're involved in that you're involved in the front end of those, uh, front end and sometimes in the fulfillment. Like when we're getting to the tricky part of really accelerating a company, right now we're evaluating a company. It's a four hundred million dollar company. This is this is one of the bigger companies that we have been evaluating. So they're generating four hundred million a year in revenue. Yes, that's insane. Yeah, and um, and and right now they are they are looking at actually doing a leverage buyout with us and having us come in and help grow the company. And I think they have I think they have a product that is ten xable over the next five years. Wow. So you know. Me taking some of my time to do that two years from now, I see myself still doing that because that's the artistry plus business development side. Yeah, and it's 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 like I call it business nirvana, meaning when you get into business and you own your first little business like a hair salon or or, or lawn mowing, you're the you're everything. You're the artist. You're the operator. You're the everything. When you learn to grow that business where you are now a successful operator and have employees doing most of the work, your next move is to become a successful owner where someone now runs it. When you're a successful owner, you're then going to iterate better, more successful companies because you have higher standards. If you have a company that does $3 million a year, you would never say, for my next endeavor, 
I'm going to build another $3 million company. You wouldn't do that. You already did that. You know, the, the nature of entrepreneurship is growth. You're like, no, we're going to go for 10 million or 20 million or whatever. And I tell most people, it's not until you iterate your fifth business before you even have a shot of hitting it big because your first four are just for learning. Yeah. It's just for learning, screwing around, making millions. Acquiring relationships, acquiring yeah. resources, skills, all the stuff. And so I want to play a game right now where it's like, okay, what if I want to get involved with dozens, hundreds? I have 400 companies right now. Why not 1,000? I'd like to get to 10,000. That's so crazy. I don't think I'll ever... I love it. I don't think I'll ever graduate from that because it's that such business a big nirvana goal. is that it's, it's, it's the most challenging financial game that I think exists. I agree. Equity. I agree. And I lo- so for me, speaking of work, right? Working six days a week, I think most of what I'm doing is artistry and business development. I, nobody reports to me. 620 people, nobody reports to me. I have partners that run everything, operational partners. You know Josiah, one of my partners, amazing guy. So I don't deal with anything. I don't go to the office. I have people in my, on my exec teams that send me reports on Fridays, and they say, ask me, my, you know, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And that's it. I might have one company meeting a month. Wow. Most of what I'm doing is business development, finding new opportunities, and artistry, but I'm doing it too much. Building machines that build machines. So you have a great executive team. Yeah. Um, when I built an advisory team that came from all of my companies, so like little insight, my guilty pleasure is every time I pick a new company and it's well-funded, I'm going to go find the most intelligent human beings on the planet to run it because I want to pluck them. For example, there's a tech company that You're I'm, saying you're borrowing that you'll have that company hire them with their resources yes. that you just bought. And then I get to pull them into my private okay. advisory board yeah. to love misuse that. and abuse for creation. It's I mad science. It's so like, for example, there's a, there's a tech company that we launched, just went to MVP. It's picking up massive traction. And um, we're, we're trying to get this guy out of Idaho. He's $350,000 a year. He wants more equity than I would like to give up. But he has an in with the creation of AI at a native level. And he has those hookups and I'm like, I really want to acquire him. Yeah. No, I don't want this to sound like objectifying a human, but that beautiful soul, I want that in my empire because the native AI component. Yeah. I you're think, assembling an, a, a championship team. Yes. Right? You're, you're trying to get LeBron. Industry. Yeah. You're trying to get LeBron on your team is basically what you're doing. And that right now is what's fun for me. And yeah, because if really I do, smart. guess what happens in my six days? That, that, that's when my six quote unquote days a week of work can turn into one or two or three because I have this all-star team, not that's running my core game. I now have enough of them, millions of dollars on payroll that I can pull to help me with the development of everything else in private equity. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably two years away from that. The companies that we've acquired, we've gotten enough money in these companies to hire really great people, but not at that level yet. And when we get to that level, I can see that the problem for me is like content, right? I've got Eric here with me. I love doing it so much and I love traveling around the country and visiting everybody all over the country. I take my wife and kids with me 70% of the time. So I spend a lot of time with my kids, yeah. like a lot. And I only work from home. I don't work in the offices. That's awesome. Only work from home. I have a big studio in, in, downstairs in my movie theater turned into a whole st- studio. Dan Martell is just over at my house. He's like, dude, you'd never believe that you have a full-blown Hollywood studios over here. I'm like, cause I, I just want to work from home so I can spend four or five hours a day with my kids. I think maybe once I get out of that phase of my kids being that young and you can hear them upstairs running around and all that kind of stuff, I probably will change it to be a way. I, 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 re- I would really love to have the full day with my wife, but I don't think my wife would allow herself to get away from a two-year-old baby and a one-year-old baby for a day. Yeah. I'm a couple of years away from that. But these companies will allow me to do what you're doing. The, that's really great advice, the advisory board. Yeah. It's a, it's a level be above the executive board, essentially, is what it is. It is. And you're borrowing resources that are being paid for from cash flow from other companies. You it's it. freaking mad science. Yeah, one of my companies, uh, we wanted to hire in-house security for all of our companies, and I hired the previous attorney general for the state of Utah. Oh, John uh, Swallow. Oh, cool, John Swallow. So, and I'm just going to tell you right now that, you know, when you do as much business as you or I do, once in a while you have, you, you have legal things that come up, yep. and the weirdest thing happens when people see that John Swallow's on our team. Yeah. They just go away. Yeah. It's like, it's like basically ending the fight before someone can throw the first punch. It's like your big strong buddy walks up behind you and they're like, okay, well I'm, I'm not fighting. I'm I'm good. good. Yeah. Yeah. So 
that's what I'm enjoying about business. I don't think where you're at, man, I don't think you have to worry about like, as long as you're doing everything with your life that you want, like if you go personal inventory and you're like, okay, am I traveling enough? Is it enough time with my wife? Is it enough time with God? Is it enough time with my kids? Is it, is there a health game that I'm missing out on? Is there a hobby thing that I want to do? Like as long as you are doing everything that you want, I believe you'll always be able to scale back business to make room for those things. And it won't slow you down at all as long as you proportionally increase your standards. I think the challenge is I enjoy what I do so much. Well, I th before we rolled the camera, I'm like, dude, what do you like doing? And I'm you like, reminded I'm, me of me. You're like, dude, business and private equity and real estate. I'm like, I know, I know. But like, just out of curiosity, like, for fun, what do you like doing? You're like, you give me the same answer. I'm like, dude, I like this guy. My, yeah. fa my father, my, my, my brother-in-law, he's a professor of business. And he's like, Chris, for real, for real, what do you like to do? Like, come on. I mean, when you're not working, I'm like, well, see, that's the thing is it's not working. It's not. It's I a hobby. I don't I'm feel like I'm working at all. No, you're a creator. Yeah, I just you're, create. You're making stuff. E even, when I, even when I go speak on stage, I know you do the same thing. You go, let's say somebody asks you, come speak on stage, on stage in Orlando. You take your family out there with you. You yep. do the sp you speaking, and then you go to Disney World right after. You got it. It's a family. Everything yep. I do is a family vacation or a this. It's all intertwined. I feel like I'm living in the greatest, yeah. like, it, I could not have created this 10 years ago. Wow. Mentally. Wow. Mentally, I didn't even know this was a possibility. It's beautiful, man. It's crazy. Pace, you're crushing in real estate. You're moving heavy into the private equity game. You've got an amazing company. You guys have awesome goals. You take care of your people. I can tell you that I've spoken at enough events with you that when I hear people chit-chat about you, it's always the most positive, amazing vibe of, I love that guy. He inspires me. I love Thank the you. way he lives his life. You really are a force for good in the world. And uh, brother, today it was my pleasure to have you here. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your time. For anyone that wants to find you, how do they do that? Just Online. DM me on Instagram or watch our YouTube channel. We're just, we really do copy a lot of what you do. You've been such a, a leader in this industry and I appreciate you for that. You've changed a lot of people in my community's lives because of what you've given to me. So thank you for that. Um, but our YouTube channel is great. Just my name, Pace Morby, Instagram, Pace Morby. And uh, final thought, I've got all these entrepreneurs likely that are listening in. Yeah. And if there's one piece of advice that you could give them on the way out for just how to level up their life, what's working for you? Get in the room, right? The people that you love, you, you look up to, get in the room with those people. So it's not enough to watch them on social. I think it's a, at some point it's a waste of your time. I think the consumption thing is what is rotting people's brains. It's like the, what happens, you see this on Instagram and TikTok. People are swiping up, swiping up. That's meant to be like to tease you to go to long form. Yep. Long form is to make you make like sure you have a YouTube enough. video or a yeah. podcast. And then go, I want to be around these people. I want to do deals with them. That's supposed like three months of watching the long form content. You should be in the room with somebody. Yeah, you should be sitting with them, learning with them. Because yeah, I like you've got you've got an event on February first and second yeah. coming up in twenty twenty four. Those are the types of rooms you want to be in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You want to be with the other people that are on the same pathway. The problem is you go to church, great people, they have the same pathway towards God and what, what your values are, but professionally, you've got to pick those rooms as well. Yeah. You've got to find the rooms where people are as motivated and, and geared towards success as you want to be. Hanging out with the people that you're hanging out with is what's killing your whole business. When I look back at all of the failures or the lack of traction that I had in my life, it was all because I had a lack of friends that were doing anything. They were running businesses, making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, living that life. But guess how much I was also making? A couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Second, I hang out with people that are wanting more. I end up wanting more. Second, I want more. I do more. I then hang out with people that are doing. It's literally the five people you're hanging out with the most has been my, my hack. Thank you. Pace Morby. Brother, thank yeah. you so much for being here today. Thank on you. On the Chris Crone Show. We'll see you guys next time.